Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for attending this week's Brown Bike Launch Seminar. And this week, and uh, we are glad to have Isaac Dashell and uh, Jacob Zhang and give us a presentation. And first, we will have uh, uh, Isaac to present a development of a soft robotics uh, transigrity rover for planetary exploration. And Jacob, uh, sorry, uh, Isaac uh, is a six years undergraduate student with 10 semesters of undergraduate research experience in uh, Professor Julian Rimaldi's computational solid mechanics lab. He is a published uh, author and have been awarded the Puri twice and for his research. Um, okay, Isaac. Okay, uh, so like, thank you, Dr. Sun. So like Dr. Sun said, my name is Isaac Dovage. I am part of the Computational Solid Mechanics Lab undergraduate research team, and I will be talking about our research project today, a soft robotics tensegrity rover. So some background first. You may be thinking to yourself, what is soft robotics? Soft robotics is a specific subfield of robotics. The robots in this field are constructed from and make use of compliant materials so that they are able to deform. Not only are they able to deform, but they can return to their original state after deforming with no loss of functionality. Okay, so now what is tensegrity? Tensegrity is a lattice structure comprised of rigid broad bars and cables connected to each other via nodes. The rigid bars and cables form individual units, and then the units connect to each other to form the overall lattice. The big idea behind tensegrity structures and why they are so useful is the fact that it can be incorporated into the field of soft robotics. Although somewhat unconventional when compared to the robots you saw in the previous slide, Tensegrity structures exhibit the same ability to undergo severe deformation and return to their original state. So how do tensegrity structures accomplish this? They accomplish this feat through the buckling of their rigid bars. In this clip, you can see that as the units impact the ground and are subjected to compression force, the bars buckle. Although a major component of the structure, the bars are not relied on for structural integrity in a pre-buckled state. This is not the case with most rigid structures. Most rigid structures fail when load-bearing members buckle. And in fact, the term buckling is synonymous with failure. So take, the, take this case of elastic buckling shown here, of ideal elastic buckling shown here. Uh, the most rigid structures only take advantage of pre-buckling energy absorption, shown by the red triangle, as they do not want their members to reach a critical buckling load. However, when tensegrity bars elastically buckle, they take advantage of the entire area under the elastic buckling curve, leading to several times the amount of energy absorption. We refer to this as the bars storing elastic potential energy. Because of this unique method of storing energy, a tensegrity lattice by nature already exhibits features that make it a good candidate as a lander rover vehicle. It is able to absorb impact energy as elastic potential energy. This ability to control kinetic and potential energy is imperative for low microgravity environments. This is made evident by missions like Philae a probe attempting to land on an asteroid that bounced a kilometer off target, off target after impacting the asteroid surface. Also, because each unit of the tensegrity lattice can compress individually, this allows for certain maneuvers to be performed, such as a jump or flip. This is the idea that my research project focuses on. If you can control when and how much each unit stores elastic potential energy, and also when to release it, you can direct the motion of the lattice by jumping and flipping in defined directions. 
So now how do you accomplish this? Well, you first have to build a tin cyber lattice. Let's not get ahead of ourselves here. Uh, when I first joined the, this project in the summer of 2017, no lattices had been built yet, only a single unit, and it was still uncertain exactly how to go about connecting them together. This proof of concept was demonstrated by the aluminum lattice we built shown here. Unfortunately, the aluminum lattice was much too heavy and bulky to realistically attempt maneuvers with. We then redesigned our components and used lighter materials. We transitioned from using aluminum bars and nodes to carbon fiber bars and 3D printed nodes made from nylon 12 or PA 12. Switching to carbon fiber rods significantly reduced our weight and increased the bar's modulus of elasticity by over 40%. Additionally, the entire node was redesigned through SOLIDWORKS to minimize the volume of the node and switching from aluminum to PA12 helped decrease the density of the, of the node material by over 60%. These design decisions were crucial to the success of our project as it ultimately got us to a point where the lattice could start performing flips and withstand the testing being made from light and durable materials. Okay, so now on to the fun part. So now that you have gotten to see exactly what a tensegrity lattice is, how it functions, and what its advantages over other structures are, how do you go about adding the means of locomotion to it? And I mean, in order to be called a rover, it has to move right. So if you look at the geometry of a single tensegrity unit, you can see that there are three pairs of parallel faces. But by then controlling the length, um, we, we can exploit this part of the geometry and add an actuating cable between each of the parallel faces uh, shown by, on the image to the left. Then by controlling the length of this actuating cable, you can control how much each unit is compressed. This is exactly what we implemented. We connected a Kevlar thread as an actuating cable to the bottom face of a unit and a spooling mechanism to the top face that controls the length of the thread by retracting it in and out. We call, we call this mechanism the retractable cable mechanism or RCM for short. The RCM is comprised of a ratcheting gear controlled by two servos that manage the length of the actuating cable. For initial testing, we added an actuating cable only in one direction for simplicity. However, we ultimately want to incorporate a mechanism that controls actuating cables in all three directions and is, is located centrally within each unit. So before, it design, before the design of the RCM could begin, it was necessary to brainstorm possible required functions of the RCM actuator system. Given the possible scenarios, the tensegrity lattice would be facing in a microgravity environment. So now imagine a tensegrity rover descending to land on an asteroid surface or a similar microgravity environment. As it lands, the units, the units compress as the bars buckle and it begins absorbing kinetic energy from impact as elastic potential energy. In order to prevent the rover from bouncing off target or even off the asteroid, we would want to lock each unit at its maximum compression point and do so almost instantaneously, not allowing any unit to release any stored energy from impact. This is where our first requirement of, of the requirement matrix is derived from. We want, to, we want the cable to reel in fast and lock while the unit compresses. Having now stuck our landing, we want to perform a flip to move to a new location. But some of the units are not compressed enough and some of the units are compressed too much or shouldn't be compressed at all. We then want to compress and decompress each unit to its desired state, 
but now doing so slowly as to not alter our position with a sudden release of energy. These are where our second and fourth requirements come in. And I'll, I'll mention why this is our fourth requirement shortly. Uh, where it's our fourth and not third. So lastly, now we are in the correct position with each unit compressed to its desired state. We want to quickly release the actuating cables now to transform the stored elastic potential energy to kinetic energy and perform a flip in our anticipated direction. This is our third requirement, have the cable to be able to reel out quickly. The first three requirements make up what we designated necessary to, pro to prove the feasibility of locomotion as a function of the tensegrity lattice. The lattice must go from its original uncompressed state to state with a unit or multiple units compressed, the second requirement. Then quickly release and perform a flip, the third requirement. Lastly, store the energy upon impact after the flip is performed, the first requirement. The order of these requirements shown in the matrix is the order in which we tackled them. The fourth, however, we deemed necessary only for defined for refined locomotion or more advanced maneuvers, so this was not included as part of our initial focus. The first requirement is satisfied by a constant force spring in the ratchet lock. The actuating cable is spooled around inside the housing and connected to a ratcheting gear on in one end of the constant force spring. The ratcheting gear behaves just like an ordinary ratchet. It is able to rotate in one direction, but not the other when the lock is engaged, and both directions when the lock is disengaged. How the constant force spring operates is similar to that of a traditional spring. When you pull on a traditional spring, it exerts a force in the opposite direction and ultimately wants to return to its original length. This concept is similar to, this concept is similar for the constant force spring. However, the constant force spring rotates around a fixed point, is wound up, and provides a torque in the opposite direction. The force of a tensegrity unit expanding is greater than this torque and winds the constant force spring around a fixed pin inside the housing, reeling the actuating cable out. When the cable, when the unit is compressed and no longer exhibits any expansion force, the torque of the constant force spring takes over and reels in the cable past the engaged ratchet lock. As the unit goes back to expand, the ratchet lock prevents this motion by stopping the actuating cable from reeling out. The second requirement is satisfied by a servo that rotates the ratcheting gear past the engaged ratchet lock. This servo utilizes a favorable gear ratio to slowly reel in the actuating cable and slowly compresses the unit. Again, because the lock is engaged, it prevents the cable from reeling out. Well, this was supposed to be a video. Not sure why it's not working. Hmm. Well, I'll, I'll describe what happened in the video. Um, the, third, uh, the third requirement is satisfied by a servo that releases the ratchet lock. As the lock is disengaged, the ratcheting gear is now free to rotate in either direction, allowing the tensegrity unit to rapidly release any stored elastic potential energy. So as you can see in, uh, in, the, uh, in the image here, the, the unit is fully compressed. So as the, as the servo releases the ratchet lock, it 
releases all the elastic ener the elastic potential energy and bounces off the ground. Now let's hope this works. With these three requirements met, it would now be possible to show the feasibility of locomotion to create a tensegrity rover. Each of these requirements we have tested individually, and we are currently working on combining them into a single RCM with the hopes of soon performing a flip, storing energy upon impact, compressing the units, and performing another flip with no human intervention. Finally, I want to talk about uh, an, an interesting preliminary conclusion we found while testing. And it involves uh, these cameras you can see here in the background of this video. These cameras are part of our 12 camera Vicon, Vicon 3D motion capture system. The cameras are designed to recognize highly reflective spherical shapes. Luckily for us, our nodes are mostly spherical, except for the cable attachments. Therefore, we are able to cover the nodes with reflective tape and the cameras will identify them. Uh, shown here are some of the snapshots of what we saw in the Vicon software for the previous flip tests. The software is able to track each of the nodes in 3D space. Because of this, flips can then be recorded and the software generates a data set of coordinates for each node for the duration of the recording. From this data, we can track each node in 3D space track the center of mass of the entire lattice, and even the relative distance between nodes. Uh, we hope to utilize the, the last one in, in uh, the future to determine forces experienced by the bars throughout different maneuvers to help us understand the dynamics of tensegrity structures. So using this Vicon camera system, we recorded and tracked the, mat, the center of mass of a two-unit lattice for 27 individual flips. These occurred at varying inclinations and three different cable retraction levels. Looking at these figures, lambda represents the level of cable retraction. Figure A is the lowest level, with figure C being the highest level of retraction. Additionally, XCM uh, represents our horizontal distance traveled and the ZCM, the vertical. Looking at the point of initial impact on figure A, you can see that the value is approximately 0 0.9, while figure C, the higher retraction level, is, around, is, is actually around 0 0.6. So this appears to be somewhat counterintuitive as, some, as you would assume that higher retraction levels, which are associated with larger energy storage, would result in a longer horizontal distance traveled. But however, after going back and looking at recorded tests, we noticed for higher retraction levels, the lattice becomes airborne and rotates about its center of mass losing horizontal velocity in the process. For the lower compressed trials, one unit remains in contact with the ground for the duration of the test, um, making use uh, or exploiting um, friction with the ground. This led us to an interesting prelim this led us to our interesting preliminary conclusion that in order to maximize horizontal distance traveled, you would actually minimize compression levels to account for friction conditions. Overall, this means a tensegrity rover could be even more energy efficient than what we expected. So with that, I conclude my presentation. I wanted to thank my research prof advisor, uh, Professor Julian Ramoli, for giving me this opportunity to work on his research project as well as the entire CSML undergraduate research team, without which, without everyone's hard work, no, none of this would have been able to be accomplished. Hopefully you learned something interesting and you have been inspired to look at rovers in a whole new way.
Uh, with that, I'll now take any questions. Any questions? Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Um, is there any question from the audience? Okay, I didn't hear any. Um, here, I have a quick question. Um, I like so when you uh, design this sim, and uh, uh, oh, let's see if there's something on the chat over. Do you need to do any simulation? I recall uh, 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 Dr. Uh, Rimaldi developed a, a, a software and you can help you design this kind of a structure with a nose. Yes, so um, so the simulations are more what uh, the graduate students work on. Uh -huh. yeah. um, and actually uh, our, uh, one of our publications deals with uh, comparing the simulation to actual experimental results. Uh -huh. So uh, Dr. Amoli uh, and his students have uh, created this simulation software to make these and analyze the dynamics of these of these mm -hmm. sensitivity lattices. Mm -hmm. But the hope of building them physically is to um, verify those simulations by actual experimental results. I see. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, any other questions? Okay, if there are no questions, uh, so thank you, uh, Isaac. Uh, thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So now let's switch to Jacob. Jacob, can you share your screen? Uh, yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, can you see this? Mm, yeah, I can see it. Uh, okay. Okay. All right. Uh, All right, hi everybody. Uh, uh, let me introduce you first. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah. Hi everybody. Uh, so next we will have Jacob John to give us the presentation on MBSE modeling of an admin Mars mission system. And Jacob John is a uh, 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 a senior undergraduate student graduating this semester and continuing with a master's degree uh, in spring 2021, that is next year. His interest is in systems design and he is working with Dr. Santley and Dr. Peak at ASDL in model-based systems engineering and system machine learning. Okay, Jacob, yours. Uh, so hi, my name is Jacob, uh, and I'll be presenting on model-based systems engineering modeling of um, aspects of an unmanned Mars mission system. And so as a brief overview, um, first we will, uh, I will go over the background uh, for the project and then the project concept itself. Um, then we'll move on to the project scope, uh, what it covers, um, and then we'll move on to the actual aspects of the project itself which involves the requirements modeling, structure modeling, uh, parametric analysis, and finally the uh, instances uh, involved. Um, so as a brief background, uh, I started this project in summer 2020, so last semester, and it was my second semester working with uh, model-based systems engineering. Um, as a kind of brief overview description of what model-based systems engineering is, it's this approach to systems design of requirements modeling, analysis, um, uh, validation and verification, et cetera, 
that is based around a single model rather than a whole bunch of disparate uh, documents like Excel sheets, etc. Um, so it's really focused on that single model to uh, encapsulate all the aspects of systems design. And so the first semester uh, I was working with Dr. Simtoy and Dr. Peak, it was spent mainly completing introductory materials to become more familiar with the systems modeling language, uh, SysML, uh, in MagicTraw, which is this uh, program that's used to uh, uh, that we work in for the model-based systems engineering process. And then at the end of that semester, uh, we worked on this team project for modeling the Apollo lunar roving vehicle. Um, and then so the first half of the second semester was spent completing the model authoring program. Uh, it's basically the set of training material that was used to become more fluent in SysML. So whereas the first semester was spent doing introductory materials, this was more in-depth, kind of goes over um, kind of what the best practices are and some of the finer details. Um, for systems engineering and working with uh, Magic Draw. And so the latter half of the second semester was spent applying uh, MBSE to this individual project. And so the concept for the individual project was the unmanned Mars mission system. And so the idea came up uh, since at the time I was concurrently taking uh, AE 6355 uh, planetary entry and descent. And for that class, we had to do some uh, work on aerodynamic uh, heat shield and trajectory analysis. And there was a final project which involved writing a MATLAB program to simulate the aerodynamics and trajectory for a planetary entry vehicle. Um, so since I was working on that anyways, uh, the idea was to integrate this aerodynamic and trajectory analysis program with uh, Magic Draw and to create uh, a model uh, that encapsulated those aspects of the uh, aerodynamics and trajectory analysis. Um, so the project scope involves um, uh, a couple of main components. These are modeling requirements for an unmanned Mars mission. Uh, second, to interface with MATLAB and run aerodynamic analysis uh, to use the program that I was writing uh, for the other class. And then to work out the framework or block definition diagrams. Basically, these are uh, diagrams which have blocks to represent the uh, aspects, components, or subsystems, et cetera, for a vehicle. And one specialization is basically just this specific instance for a specific architecture of that vehicle. Um, and then after that, uh, I had to perform parametric analysis and mass rollup calculations for at least one of those architectures. And finally, uh, have one solved instance where an instance is just uh, the model, but with specific values and a specific architecture. Um, so within that instance, you have these given uh, inputs, and then through that parametric analysis, you uh, create uh, outputs for that specific instance. And here we have a, a package diagram, which shows the main elements of the model. Um, as you can see, there are four main packages. There are requirements, the physical structure, uh, instances with the one configuration, and the parametric analysis. And as you can see, within the analysis block, there are uh, several um, subsystem blocks that encapsulate the uh, main elements of the project. Um, and so beginning with the requirements modeling, um, due, to due to some time constraints, uh, only some aspects of the system could be modeled. And so since the main point of this was to uh, combine this modeling with the planetary entry and uh, aerodynamic analysis, uh, the two main aspects uh, that were focused on for this overall project uh, and the requirements in general are just the planetary entry vehicle itself and the launch vehicle. Um, the launch vehicle will be included to um, make some more use of the parametric analyses for calculating delta V and uh, overall mass. Um, and as you can see from the diagram on the right, there is traceability all the way from the highest level all the way down to the lowest level. Um, it, it's a bit hard to see, but there are uh, uh, relationships that show where each uh, requirement on every level comes from, as well as justifications for why those requirements are needed and how they support those overall higher level requirements for the mission. Um, so to begin with, we have the high level requirements for the system being for the unmanned Mars mission system. and there was a bit of a backwards approach in terms of selecting which high-level requirements 
to include in the scope of the project since the um, beginning of this project was to uh, model that planetary entry part. Um, but from, from these high level requirements, all the lower level requirements can be derived. And uh, as you can see from the diagram, there's also a block that represents the unmanned Mars mission system itself. And there are relationships that go from the block to every, uh, every requirement, which, <clears throat> which represent that the block has to satisfy those requirements. And uh, since at this level, the requirements are fairly general, uh, it's the block itself that satisfies the requirement, but as you'll see later, uh, there are other ways for uh, this relationship to happen. Um, so moving on, we have the Mars Entry Vehicle spec. Um, so the requirements in this Mars Entry Vehicle specification are primarily derived from the high-level system requirement uh, for the overall mission uh, for safe landing. And so, for example, uh, one requirement is the Mars entry vehicle shall be capable of maneuvering to a target destination, uh, which is required for safely landing. And as you'll see later, that will also flow down into more specific requirements for lower level systems. Another such example is um, the uh, Mars entry vehicle shall be designed such that the deceleration experienced upon atmospheric entry is survivable by the equipment. And that, of course, also flows down from the requirement for a safe landing. And uh, these, are, uh, these requirements are all satisfied by the Mars entry vehicle. Uh, similar to the high-level requirements, it is the block itself that satisfies the requirements. Um, but moving on, we have the trajectory specification. Um, this involves aspects like peak heat rate, integrated heat load, peak deceleration, and range. And uh, as you can see from the image on the right, rather than the block itself satisfying the requirements. These are more specific performance requirements with uh, actual values. So rather than the block satisfying, it is these value properties of these blocks, such as peak, uh, peak heat rate for the trajectory, integrated heat load of the trajectory, max range of the trajectory, these value properties that satisfy the performance requirements. So moving on, we also have the aeroshell specifications, and these become more specific. Uh, starting with the uh, uh, requirement AS.1, which is that the uh, Mars entry vehicle aeroshell shall be compatible with the planned trajectory. And this is rather uh, general. However, it's broken down into more specific performance requirements, which are that the aeroshell shall have a lift to drag ratio of greater than 0.5, that the aeroshell shall have a coefficient of drag between 0.1 and, or 0.5 and 1, and also that the aeroshell cross-section shall be between 70 and 60 square meters. Um, so overall, these are also uh, more specific performance requirements now, which are again satisfied by the value properties of the aeroshell, lift coefficient, drag coefficient, uh, lift to drag ratio. And uh, I can't seem to move to the next slide right now. Um, so. Uh, yeah, it seems like uh, uh, your network uh, is not very good. So let's wait for one or two minutes. All right. I think we can uh, try to uh, turn off the video. OK. Uh, seems my computer is frozen right now. Um, I can't. Uh, I can't do anything. Yeah. And how about uh, you turn it off? I mean, turn the blue jeans off and try to log in again. Right. Yeah. I can try that. Mm -hmm. And we can post the editing this part and remove it. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all right. We can be connected in the video. Um, 
Yeah, it, it seems that I can't close out of blue jeans either. <laughs> okay, so um, <laughs> the shot on the computer. Uh, yeah, are you I might have to restart my computer. <laughs> yeah, I'll task uh, to turn it off. So yeah, sorry about when that. When is the theater waiting for you?
Hey, Dick. Welcome back. Uh, hi. Thanks. Thanks for waiting. Uh, apologies for the technical difficulties. Uh, uh, no problem. You can start uh, where you stopped it again. All right. Um, uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Um, was was this the slide that we were on? Uh, Aeroshell? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Uh, I think I covered everything. Uh, lift, drag, oh, lift, drag, ratio. Okay. So moving on to the heat shield specification, this is also a lower level uh, requirement. So these are performance requirements. Uh, for example, the heat shield shall be capable of withstanding a peak heat rate of 500 kilowatts per square meter. And these are satisfied by uh, properties of the heat shield, such as maximum uh, heat rate or max integrated heat load. Um, and moving on to the physical structure of the system, this is represented by a block definition diagram where each block is represented, uh, where each block represents a uh, system, subsystem, or component of the overall uh, system. And these uh, arrows flowing from, flowing down from one block to another uh, illustrates the part breakdown. So the uh, lower level blocks are parts of the higher level box um, and the numbers by those relationships, for example, the one by the relationship between Mars mission system and uh, Mars entry vehicle, that represents the multiplicity. So that means there's one Mars entry vehicle within the uh, Mars mission system. Um, so as you can see, the breakdown uh, goes primarily for the Mars entry vehicle, breaking down into the aeroshell, heat shield, power subsystem, comms subsystem. And then for the launch vehicle, it's broken down into three stages, the first, second, third. And then within each stage, there's also a propulsion subsystem, which is comprised of a propellant tank and engine. And so uh, moving on to the analysis block definition diagram, this is very similar to the physical structure. However, uh, there are also blocks like trajectory which don't necessarily represent a physical uh, subsystem or component, uh, but they encapsulate uh, values uh, like aspects of the trajectory, um, such as range, et cetera, which uh, are useful to have for participating in parametric analysis. And so as you can see, another key difference is that this diagram also shows the value and part properties of each block, uh, which aren't necessarily needed for the physical structure breakdown. Um, moving on to the mass roll-up parametric diagram. This is a pattern uh, for that's applied to each block uh, for calculating the uh, mass roll-up of the overall system. And as you can see, this consists of value type or values, uh, which are the, um, the elements in yellow boxes. And then there's a constraint block, which uh, performs the calculations between the uh, values in order to uh, get the output. And so in this case, the constraint says that the total mass is equal to the mass of the parent plus the sum of all the masses of the child parts. And so this is how the mass of each component is calculated uh, within the system. And moving on, here's a parametric diagram for the analysis in calculating the total delta V. And as you can see, there are the three stages, first, second, third stage. And then there are also other values like the total mass, payload mass, mass of fuel, which all participate in these uh, parametric relationships uh, with these constraint blocks in order to finally calculate the delta V. Um, moving on to the aerodynamic analysis, uh, the program that uh, I used or I wrote and used, uh, used an STL file uh, input to model 3D models and this specific uh, uh, project used the Mars Science Laboratory geometry as the reference uh, design for the aerodynamic uh, analysis. And this was done using the modified Newtonian method, uh, which basically says that the coefficient of pressure at each uh, point on the surface that's incident to the flow, to the hypersonic flow, is uh, given by the relationship Cp max times cosine squared of the angle between the normal and the uh, flow. And so 
Um, there was some uh, limited compatibility with Magic Draw with how uh, Magic Draw couldn't open the STL files uh, while I was running MATLAB within the program. And so there, uh, I couldn't directly integrate the program into the model. However, what ended up happening is I just ran the uh, program outside of Magic Draw, outside the program, and then directly manually input the values uh, such as lift to drag ratio, uh, lift coefficient, and drag coefficient. And so moving on, another calculation that was performed was ballistic coefficient, which is fairly straightforward. Uh, B equals M over CDA, and these were done using uh, values from the aeroshell. And uh, yeah, moving on to the trajectory and heat shield calculations, this was again represented by a parametric diagram. And so because of the limitations of the software, uh, analytical solutions were used as approximations. Uh, for example, for peak heating, the Sutton Graves equation was used. For range, uh, that was calculated by assuming equilibrium guide glide, which is a fairly good approximation for most of the trajectory, uh, while the uh, trajectory, while the vehicle is still uh, at supersonic, hypersonic speeds. Um, and finally, the integrated heat load is adapted from the Chapman equation for that aforementioned equilibrium glide trajectory. And so these analytical equations were modeled inside the constraint blocks and uh, the values of interest like max range, peak deceleration were calculated through these. And finally, here we have the solved instances. Uh, this over here on the right is the uh, instance diagram for the entire system. And so in, in this solved instance, the configuration uh, of the launch vehicle was modeled after the Saturn V uh, launch vehicle. And so you can see on the bottom here, within each propulsion uh, subsystem for the launch vehicle stages. Uh, for example, the first stage is the one on the left. There are five uh, F1 engines. And on the second stage, there are five J2 engines. And on the right for the third stage, there's one J, uh, white J2 engine as well. And so for a launch vehicle, uh, a lot of the values uh, were came, uh, came from um, existing values for the Saturn V. And so this whole launch vehicle configuration was modeled after that. Um, so using these values uh, result in a mass roll up, a total mass of 2,957,800 uh, kilograms. And so this was done using the uh, parametric uh, mass roll up pattern that I mentioned uh, earlier, um, each, where each part is the uh, sum of the part mass itself, as well as the sum of all its children. Um, and so for trajectory, we have a few more parameters. Um, of note, uh, the peak deceleration in Gs is 1.355 Gs, which of course satisfies the initial requirement of being less than five Gs. And uh, there are other parameters like max range, where it's 1,597 kilometers, which is more than the initial requirement, I think, of 1,000. Um, and so for the launch vehicle as well, the delta V is calculated to be 13,600 approximately uh, meters per second, which is again, I think greater than the initial requirement for delta V. And so all these parameters are solved using the parametric solver, uh, which uses those parametric uh, uh, constraint blocks and parametric diagrams in order to propagate the values through. So you can change, um, for example, the given each each parameter has a causality, either given, ancillary, or target, and so you can change the given parameters in order to uh, get different uh, target uh, values, um, without having to rerun analysis or rerun all the redo all the parametric diagrams. Um, so that's one of the benefits of uh, using this model-based uh, approach. Um, so that's the end of my presentation. Um, are there any questions? All right, thank you, Jacob. Um, are there any questions from the audience? Okay, I have one. Um, in your design, uh, how do you estimate the uh, overall mass and also the uh, uh, specific impulse you needed for the launch? 
Um, right. So the specific impulse was uh, I used uh, values for the F1 and J2 engines specifically. Um, and those are modeled within the engine blocks. And so each within each um, each stage, there are the engine blocks as well as fuel and uh, uh, oxidizer masses. And so uh, inside the trajectory or inside the delta V calculation, uh, the specific impulse is a value of the uh, stage that's calculated from like the average of all the specific impulses of the engine that comprise that stage. And then using that specific impulse uh, and the uh, mass of the fuel for that stage, um, these uh, relations are used uh, to calculate the total delta V of that stage. Um, so for the mass, the kind of uh, approach is to use that mass roll-up uh, parametric diagram. And so this kind of, you start with the lower level masses, like for the mass for each engine, and those are directly input based on what the actual mass for example, the F1 engine is, or the first stage is, and then those are propagated upwards uh, through each stage to get masses for every subsystem, system, et cetera, and the mass of the overall system. And then that overall mass is then used in this delta V parametric diagram as total mass. And then for example, the first stage, the initial dry mass, or the wet mass is the total mass of the system, right? And then the empty mass is the mass minus uh, the fuel mass of the first stage. And these kind of constraint blocks are how uh, the, the mass of the fuel is subtracted from the total mass before. Um, uh, <laughs> does, does that kind of answer the question? Oh, yeah. Um, uh, one following up question, how did you uh, calculate the total mass of the uh, rocket I mean, you have the weight of the engine and propellant, and how about other components? How did you uh, estimate the overall weight? Right. Um, so since uh, this is kind of like a higher level uh, model, um, the, the values that were used were for what could be found, like the engines, uh, their masses are pretty easily found, but there are also components like electronics, uh, screws, et cetera, that, uh, don't necessarily have to be modeled like specifically. Uh, and those masses are kind of just uh, wrapped up into the whole like first stage block uh, for that total, for that mass. Um, so the whole, um, the mass of the first stage is taken by just, uh, as just a whole lump sum. And then the engine masses and stuff are added uh, uh, in addition. All right, thank you very much. Are there other questions from the audience? Okay, so I didn't hear anything. Uh, if, there are, if there are no questions from the audience, so let's conclude uh, uh, this week's uh, from Bike Launch Seminar. Thank everybody. Take care.